Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello students, welcome to Swayam Prabha channel. I am going to take up the course titled as White Collar Crimes and I am Swati Solanki working as Assistant Professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. Today's session is going to be focused on the overview of the Prevention of Corruption Act 1988. During the session, we are going to trace the history of the anti-graft law in the Indian context and to understand the definition of a public servant. After having, underst after having understood that, we will, be following, we will be discussing the meaning of the public duty and in the concluding part of the lecture, we will be trying to understand the meaning of undue advantage. Now if one to trace the history of anti-corruption laws in India, the starting point could be tracing the law as contained under section 161 to 164 AIPC of 1860. Then the Delhi Police, the Special Police Establishment Act of 1946, the Prevention of Corruption Act 1947 and to examine the working of the Prevention of Corruption Act 1947 Bakshi Tek Chand Committee was constituted in the year 1949, which led to the criminal amendment in the year 1952 and after that, Anti-Corruption Laws Amendment Act 1964 was made following the recommendations made by the Santhanam Committee 1962. After this, it was realized that the functioning of the anti-corruption laws in India was not as successful and in order to have one single code, one new legislation was brought and that was the Prevention of Corruption Act 1988. When this act came into the picture, the earlier provisions contained in the IPC from section 161 to 164A and plus 165A were repealed from there on. Further, we are at a point wherein we are looking at the obligation of the India after having ratified the United Nations Convention Against Corruption and in order to meet those standards, one amendment was further done in the year 2018 when the bill was introduced to amend the following law in the year 2013. So when we look at the recommendations of the Law Commission in 254th report, it has tried to bring the law in parity with the UK Bribe Act 2010. So let's get to the starting point when the law was contained in the Indian Penal Code. Now the law as we see on the screen has become obsolete in the presence of the present Act of 1988 but nonetheless it is important for us to make a reference to the important key terms which were being used in here and as highlighted with the different ink. So if one asks that what is the minimum threshold for the anti-corruption law to be applied, the minimum requirement is that the person who can be prosecuted under the Prevention of Corruption Act must be a public servant. Now, if we look at these provisions, if we were to ask this question that who is a public servant, then the reference would be made to section 21 of the IPC, which enlists different types of public servant. What is interesting to note in there that the enumeration of the list does not focus on that whether this person is discharging any function in the interest of the society at large, 
but the focus was whether this person was employed by the government, be it central government or the state government. Now, if one think about that if the minimum threshold of application of the law is that the person is necessarily to be a public servant, the question may come to your mind that when we talk about, let's say, a municipal commissioner, he is not being appointed by the central government or the state government. He has been selected by the, in his constituency, subjected to the approval by the state. Now, when we talk about whether MLA was a public servant within the definition of Section 21 of the IPC, since the focus was on the employing authority and municipal commissioner was not appointed by any of the governments, he would then fall outside the purview of the definition of public servant. Now, imagine a scenario where municipal commissioner is taking bribe to secure a contract with his friend. In that scenario, he was not prosecuted under any of the provisions of the IPC. Now, further, when we look at the word gratification other than legal remuneration, within IPC, the word gratification was not described or defined anywhere. The common understanding of the word gratification becomes then important for us to understand. So, in one of the next slides, we will be looking at the meaning of these different key terms which have been used in here. So, another point that is to be noted on this slide is that if we look at section 161, the word public servant has been used. As I said, it is the minimum threshold for the application of the law. But when you look at section 162 and 163, the word a person has been used instead of a public servant. So let's say the wife of a judge was able to influence his own husband in order to give a favorable order from to that person from whom she has accepted the bribe, she would be prosecuted under section 163, which says a person who accepts, obtains or agrees to accept or attempts to obtain gratification for inducing or by exercising personal influence with any public servant. So what is important in here is that, that not only the public servant who are working for the government machinery, was prosecuted, but anyone who was able to influence the decision of the public servant would also be prosecuted under the aforementioned provision. Now, sometimes we may come across certain examples wherein the public servant does not take gratification, which is a pecuniary gratification, simply stating he does not take monetary bribe. Rather, let's say he is a government officer whose responsibility is to allot the piece of land and in order to get the approval for the land to be developed by the real estate company or business, they apply to this officer and secure this contract that yes, they can develop this barren piece of land. Now, in this process, what the public servant has done, that he has not taken any money, but he had rather asked this business entity that in lieu of this favor, I want one piece of land in the name of himself or in the name of his family member. So now here, he has taken a valuable thing without paying any consideration. He has obtained an advantage for himself without paying any consideration for it. As I said, the key terms public servant is important to understand the application of the law. 
Now, the other two terms which were previously used in the last slide were accept and obtain. Now, when we understand the meaning of accept, it suggests that a public servant may voluntarily accept the gratification. He may not have asked for it to do a particular job, but the bribe giver had come to him and offered the gratification. In this concept of acceptance, the initiative is not taken by the public servant, rather the initiative is taken by the bribe giver and he has voluntarily accepted the bribe. Now how the word or the concept obtain is different from acceptance? In obtainment, there has to be necessarily an element of demand. So this voluntarily acceptant has to be preceded by the demand. So in this example, if a public servant to do a particular job correctly, he asks for bribe. So he is taking the initiative wherein he is demanding the bribe and the other person then voluntarily offers that bribe. So this aspect of obtainment and then acceptance would fall under the third bullet that is the obtain. As I said previously that the word gratification was nowhere defined under the Indian Penal Code. So it was commonly understood as gratification which is pecuniary gratification that is monetary gratification or gratification that is estimable in money. So for instance if for securing the contract in the tender processing, the government officer or the public servant says that I want to take a trip to Singapore and I want you to arrange the tickets for it and the accommodation for it. Now in this example, he has not taken the money, but the tickets and the stay is something that could be converted into money and he has taken it wrongfully without paying any consideration for it. So gratification would include both pecuniary gratification and something that is estimable in money. Now on the previous slide, when we look at the public servant takes gratification, he does so by abusing his power, right? So when he is abusing the office, the public office that he is holding, it is important for us to understand that when we speak of abuse, is it any different from the word or the concept misuse? The answer is certainly yes. And the answer is, and the difference lies in terms of the degree. So when someone talks about misuse, I may pull off any contact in the government department to process your application. Why? Because I am known to this public servant in this office. So what I have done, the public servant has misused his power. Now when he has misused his power, he is not violating any law, but certainly there is an element of impropriety. So when I say impropriety, it would include violation of conduct of rules or regulations or we can say the ethics that he is expected to follow. On the other hand, when we talk about the word abuse, abuse is grave in its degree. It means that one has taken the advantage of his own power and position unfairly or excessively and this has been done with the element of dishonestly. So if I were to sum up that what are the ingredients under the concept of abuse, it will include use plus impropriety plus dishonestly. Yes, you have misused your position but that misuse of position has been used with the dishonest intention that you have wrongfully 
gained something to your advantage while causing the loss to the other person so there is an element of dishonestly when we speak of the concept abuse now when we talk about that what was the first complete legislation or at least an attempt was made to have a complete code it was the prevention of corruption act 1947 now before this act because it was seen during the british regime that corruption was existing in the war and supply department and in order to bring these public servant to the books there was a requirement of the enforcement agency who can investigate against these public servants involved in the a4 set departments so in the year 1943 the government issued one ordinance number 22 which empowered delhi special police establishment to investigate the corruption cases involving central government departments however this ordinance lapsed on 30th september 1946 and it was then replaced by delhi special police establishment act 1946 now this legislation is important for us even in today's time because it is this very act by the virtue of it the investigating agency which is commonly known as central bureau of investigation derives its power to investigate into the corruption cases from the very said legislation that is dspe act now when we talk about how the law has evolved further we have prevention of corruption act 1947 on the screen now prior to this act when we looked at the offenses given under the ipc from section 161 to 165a these offenses were non cognizable offenses now when we look at the word non cognizable it means that these offenses cannot be investigated by the officer in charge of the police without taking the prior permission from the magistrate or one could not make the arrest without taking the warrant from the so one big change that was brought by the virtue of 1947 act was that these non cognizable offenses were been made cognizable now why this was important so that the time is not lost in getting the prior approval from the court and the police officer could make the investigation against the corrupt public servants now as we all know that uh, when it comes down to taking the illegal gratification it may happen behind the closed doors and one of the important uh, criteria or principle of the criminal jurisprudence is that the onus is upon the prosecution to prove the guilt of the accused beyond the reasonable doubt unless this burden until this burden has been discharged the alleged accused will be presumed to be innocent now in such cases because the nature of the crime is such it becomes very difficult for the prosecution to say that this corrupt public servant when and where under what circumstances had accepted the illegal gratification so the prosecution now has to prove certain criteria that yes there was a demand of the gratification yes the public servant has accepted the said gratification but once the prima facie evidences are led by the prosecution the burden of proof stands shifted upon the accused that he did not take illegal gratification now what is the meaning of it within the criminal jurisprudence this is called as a fiction is created wherein a presumption is raised against the accused which is that it will be presumed this public servant 
has in fact accepted the illegal illegal gratification. So what we are presuming here? We are presuming him to be guilty, right? So we are making the departure from the ordinary jurisprudence provided under the criminal justice system. So when we raise this presumption against him, he then needs to lead the evidences to disprove this presumption. Now this concept, shifting the burden of proof, was brought under the 1947 Act via Section 4, Subclause 1, which is now Section 20 of the present Act of 1988. Another big significant change that was brought was a new offence that is criminal misconduct was added to this legislation. So when we talk about what really constitutes misconduct, so when the public servant, herein the concept of abusing the position becomes important. When the public servant has abused his office and he has accumulated, let's say, wealth in large amounts over a period of time, and then it was revealed that this public servant was in the habit of taking illegal gratification, this series of acts would culminate into having disproportionate assets in contrast to his lawful sources of income. So this was made a new offence as criminal misconduct to prosecute those corrupt public servants who had amassed great amount of monies over a period of time. Now, when we look at the functioning of the 1947 Act, though we did have a code now which made the offence from non-cognizable to the cognizable, having a new offence of criminal misconduct. But despite these efforts, the Prevention of Corruption Act 1947 failed to deal with the menace of the corruption that was flourishing at that point of time. So one committee was constituted in the year 1949, which is called as Bakshi Tekchan Committed, and it was trusted with one job to see the functioning of the 1947 Act, or if we need to make improvements in enhancing or bringing in the new offences, or improving the functioning of the enforcement agencies to bring the culprit public servants to the justice. Now, after this committee had made the recommendations, uh, one amendment was done in the year 1952 and pursuant to this one enforcement wing was added to the Delhi Special Police Establishment in the year 1953 to handle the offences involving violation of export-import regulation at Bombay, Calcutta and Madras. In the year 1955, Administrative Vigilance Division was formed within the Ministry of Home Affairs to coordinate anti-corruption measures with the central government. Following the recommendations, the following amendments were duly made. It conferred the power on the state government to appoint special judges to try the cases speedily. Secondly, now special judge could take the cognizance of this offence on a complaint or on a police report or otherwise which means suo moto under section 6 subsection 1 of the 1947 Act. Now, if we look at the First Amendment, why there was a need to try the cases speedily? Because one need to understand that we were dealing with the people who were working in the offices of the government machinery, right? And they had the power to influence the enforcement agencies, to temper with the evidences. So what was realized that because of the delays in the trial, the cases were not speedily decided and the evidences were being destroyed by these powerful public servants. So in order to prevent all of this, the cases are to be tried now speedily. 
Now, when we talk about special judge taking the cognizance on the complaint, police report or otherwise, so even if any judge who happens to be a special judge comes across any case where he see that the public servant is corrupt, he may start the, he may order the investigation to be made by the police officer. Now, another new significant development that was made uh, was in the year 1964. Another amendment was done to the 1947 Act pursuant to the Santhanam Committee which was constituted in the year 1962. Now, when we talk about the criminal misconduct as previously discussed, if the person was found to be having disproportionate assets to his income and the satisfactory explanation could not be made, it was brought under the purview of the criminal misconduct. Now, another agency was established and that agency is nowadays called as Central Vigilance Commission, which was established in the year 1964. Now, if we look at it, though the Santhanam Committee recommended that the Central Vigilance Commission should have the power to investigate into the matters of the corruption among the public servants, but when we look at the formation of the CBC, it does not have any investigation power itself However, it does have the power to get the inquiry done into any complaint or suspicion of any improper behavior against a civil servant. So when we talk about this aspect, nonetheless, CVC, after having the CVC Act of 2003, can make the preliminary inquiry themselves. If they find any substantial prima facie evidence, they can have the investigation to be done by the enforcement agencies which may exist in the given state. Right. So when we talk about what are the other functions of the Central Vigilance Commission, as I said, it can either get the investigation done through CBI or through chief vigilance officer who work in these government offices. Now, when we talk about vigilance, it also collates the data that how many complaints have been made. So, if you look up the website of Central Vigilance Commission, one may lodge the complaint in there and then they can look into that complaint, right? So, when we talk about under, you know, the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act, as I said, CBI derives its power from the very said act. However, what is to be noted that the Central Bureau of Investigation is a central investigating agency. Now, let's, for an instance, say that CBI needs to investigate a corrupt politician who belongs to any A, B or C state, whether this CBI, which is a central agency, can go into the state and conduct investigation against this public servant? The answer is no. Being the central agency, CBI is obligated. There is a statutory obligation that he first needs to take the consent from the respective state. So when we talk about consent, the consent here are of two types. One is the general consent and the second one is the case to case based consent which is called as specific consent. Now those states who have given the general consent to the CBI, they can very smoothly investigate the matters pertaining to the corruption. They don't need to take the consent every single time when they are investigating a public servant in the state. However, in the case of specific consent, they will first have to seek the consent before investigating the corrupt public servant. Now, when we talk about that, okay, CBI is the central agency, what is the agency that exists in different states? So, states have their own anti-corruption bureaus, which deals with the function of vigilance and their 
do the anti-corruption work. Now finally coming to the present law that is the prevention of the Corruption Act 1988, we first need to look into the features of the act. This act talks about within its definition clause that what is the meaning of the public duty and what is the not the meaning but how can we define a public servant. What is interesting to note in here that when we look at the definition clause, when we look at the definition clause, it does not really define the public servant. Rather, once again, it enumerates that who can be a public servant. When I say enumerate, I can say it just simply describes who is the public servant. As you can see, for the application of this law, the deciding factor at the threshold is that the person needs to be a public servant. Another important feature is the enhanced penalties. If we go back to the first slide, wherein we talked about the offences under the IPC, look at the punishment part. It says the person may be punished either with imprisonment which may be of three years or with fight or with both. Now what was realized in practical scenarios that when we look at that how much sentence has been given to a public servant, most of them were getting away with, with fine. Meaning because the word in here which was used was or and or is to be understood as disjunctive. The judges got a lot of discretion wherein they could not give any imprisonment in the form of sentence at all, only just limit the punishment to the fine. So what was happening in here that it was realized that we must have graded penalties wherein the enhanced penalties are being prescribed. So, when we look at the penalties in here, one can see the minimum sentence and the maximum sentence have been prescribed under the Act. So, once the minimum sentence has been prescribed, it puts the limitation on the exercise of the discretion of the judges that a public servant necessarily have to undergo the minimum sentence that is of the imprisonment. Now, what was further added? that provision for freezing of suspected properties during the trial and what was maintained day to day trial and when we look at the relevant provision it has been prescribed that the trial must be completed within a span of two years if for any reason it is not being completed within the aforementioned period then the reasons have to be recorded. So it must be a speaking order that why the trial could not be completed within the prescribed statutory period. Even after that, let's say the trial could not be completed, the maximum upper limit that has been provided within the provisions of the Act of 1988 is that, that in all and all the trial must be completed within a span of four years years. Now when we talk about that now we have the Prevention of Corruption Act of 1988 which is a complete code in itself which discusses who the public servant is, which discusses the meaning of the public duty, which talks about how the cases are to be tried and who will try these cases and which also then talks about the offences and the penalties. So the earlier law which was mentioned in the provisions of the IPC were repealed from the Indian Penal Code of 1860. Now it is important for us to get to the definition part of it. For us it is important to first understand the meaning of the public duty. Now once again it says it means a duty in the discharge of which the state, the public or the community at large has an interest. So when we look at this definition, it 
gives some reflection that whenever an official function is being taken into consideration, that official function concerns the interest of the public or the society at large. So, it is very interesting to note that, that recently in CBI versus Ramesh Kelly, 2016, the Supreme Court has noted that the director of a private bank, because the public interest is involved even when we are referring to the private bank, the director of the private bank could also be prosecuted under the provisions of the Prevention of Corruption Act 1988. Now, it opens a window wherein we can bring the scope of Prevention of Corruption Act even in the private spaces or the private organization. Now, why is it was possible for the court to do it? Because the court has placed the emphasis on the public duty. Even though you are a private entity, nonetheless, you are discharging a function in which the public has interest. Right? So, when we say that uh, in which the state has the interest, the explanation further talks about that what would the state as a concept include. It says, and we will underline the following aspects, it includes a corporation which is established by or under a central, provincial or state act. So, this is the first part of the explanation. So, when one asks what is the meaning of the corporation, corporation is a legal entity. Now, it also enjoys, obviously it is an artificial legal entity, it also enjoys the rights and the duties like a human or an individual does. It has its separate entity when the corporation is limited, it means that the individual may not be responsible for the acts of the corporation. Now, at this, at this uh, point, what is important? Can we think of any example wherein corporation can be defined or where it is constituted? So, the source of power for incorporating a legal entity must be a statute. So, when we talk about life insurance corporation, it has been incorporated under the Life Insurance Corporation Act. On the other hand, we also see that it is established under any state act. So, when we talk about state electricity boards or state transport corporations, where are they being incorporated? They are being respectively incorporated under the, let us say, if we talk about state transport corporation, the Road Transports Act. Then it further says, or an authority or a body controlled or aided by the government. Now, when we talk about that there is any body or any authority which is controlled by the government, it could be, the example on this point could be the state electricity board. So, the control is with the government. Further, the last part of it says the company as defined in section 617 of the Companies Act 1956. So, essentially it means that those companies where the government hold not less than 51 percent shares in the entity, that will not fall under the said explanation. So, it has to have a government company. So, we can simply say that company where a government is the majority shareholder would also fall under this clause wherein the state is included. Now, moving further, now comes the important aspect of the Prevention of Corruption Act. It says the public servant means one may think that it defines what is the meaning of public servant. But when you look at these clauses, you would come to realization that this clause C of section 2 
only describes the public servant, it does not define who the public servant is. Now we are going to go through all of these relevant subclauses. The first being any person in the service or pay of the government or remunerated by the government by fee or commission for the performance of any public duty. Now, when we talk about the first part of this definition, that is this one, any person in the service or pay of the government, right? So when we look at the word service, it may come across that this person is employed by the government or he is being appointed by the government. So the test here is whether there exists the master service relationship between the government and the public servant. The second part of it, it says he is remunerated by the government by fee or commission for the performance of any public duty. Now, there may be instances where the public servant is not appointed or not employed by the government. However, they receive salary, wages, commission or fee for the performance of the public duty. The example in this point would be of the municipal commissioner who is not employed by the government, rather he is a chosen selected candidate from his constituency. But then he is discharging a public duty for which he is getting remuner he's getting remuneration by the government. So when we talk about this aspect, so the focus is just not only the employing authority, but it is also on the remuneration in terms of the fee or commission. So when we talk about this aspect, the test is of the master and servant relationship. When we talk about master servant relationship, it is used in a sense that it manifests that not only what work is to be done is told by the government, but the manner in which the work is to be done is also told by the government. The second clause says, any person in the service or pay of local authority. So if we take the example of local authority, our municipalities, panchayats are local authorities. So any person who is working in these municipalities would automatically fall under the second clause. Third is, again, once again, you can see what we just discussed under the explanation part. So if any person is in the service or pay of a corporation established by or under a central, provincial or state act or any authority or a body owned or controlled aided by the government or a government company as defined under section 617 of the Companies Act, that person would also be a public servant. So if this person takes any illegal gratification for securing the contract with your agency, right? That you can drive the bus from place A to B and for that he has taken the illegal gratification, he would be prosecuted under the Prevention of Corruption Act because he is the public servant under Clause 3. Now, Clause 4 talks about any judge including any person empowered by law to discharge whether by himself or as a member of any body of persons, any adjudicatory functions. Now what is to be understood here is that, that not only we are talking about the judges sitting in the court rooms, but it would also include the other courts wherein they are exercising adjudicatory function. For an instance, Let's say the presiding officer of a loka dalat is not acting as a judge when he is trying to mediate between the two conflicting parties, but nonetheless he is exercising the adjudicatory functions. Another example on this point could be consumer forums. Now, taking clause 4 ahead, within fifth clause, 
Now have a look at the fifth clause. Any person authorized by a court of justice to perform any duty in connection with the administration of justice, including a liquidator, receiver, or commissioner appointed by such court. We all know a liquidator is a person who is appointed after a company goes bankrupt and the business has to be taken care of. The liquidator is going to be appointed and then this person is called as a public servant. The next is receiver. Receiver is someone who collects the rent coming from the properties which might be attached by the court. And lastly, it is the commissioner. So when the evidences are not collected and they are not something which can be collected, the commissioners are sent to that place to collect the evidences and those are the commissioners appointed which will, who will constitute the public servant under clause 5. Under clause 6, when we look at the arbitrator when he is appointed by the court would fall under clause 6 and I read, any arbitrator or other person to whom any cause or matter has been referred for the decision or report by the court of justice or by competent public authority. Now, how does this work? When the two disputing parties are before the court, they may agree the matter to be submitted before the arbitrator. Now, this is the arbitrator who is appointed by the court. Now, this arbitrator would be a public servant. Clause 7 is any person who holds an office by the virtue of which he is empowered to prepare, publish, maintain or revise an electoral role or to conduct an election or part of an election. So any person who is any person who is engaged in any duty of the electoral role even when he has to return it. And during that stage, he has accepted some gratification because he is being defined as a public servant under clause 7, he would be prosecuted within the provisions of the Prevention of Corruption Act. Now, 8th clause is very, very important and it has helped the courts to say that even the member of legislative assembly is a public servant, that a member of a parliament is a public servant, that a chief minister of a state is a public servant. So what is the basis for the courts to define these officials or to define these individuals as a public servant? We need to first read the clause. Any person who holds an office by the virtue of which he is authorized or required to perform any public duty. Now, what is important here is that when we look at the word office, it does not mean the existence of a physical office, but we are referring to the position which the public servant is holding in any given machinery. It does not matter if he is discharging a huge task or a menial job. As long as a delegated function has been provided to this public servant to complete, he would fall under clause 8 as a public servant. Again, you can notice that the emphasis is once again on the performance of the public duty. So when I had given the example of CBI versus Ramesh Kaley 2016 Supreme Court, this was another provision which came to help the courts. Now look at the ninth clause and it talks about any registered cooperative society engaged in agriculture, industry, trade or banking, receiving or having received any financial aid from the central government and what we previously read before, it continues on the similar line. So when we talk about CGHS, Cooperative Group Housing Society, any individual who is holding the office of this registered cooperative society would be a public servant in clause 9. 
Now clause 10 talks about any person who is a chairman, member or employee of any service commission or board by whatever name called or a member of any selection committee appointed by such commission or board for the conduct of any examination or making any selection on behalf of such commission or board. Now it is very interesting to note here that, that there was one scam which was called as JBT teacher scam in the Haryana government. Now the public servants in question had taken huge amount of money in selecting the candidates belonging to their friends and families. When we talk about conducting of the examination, if the paper was leaked to a particular candidate and the public servant has taken gratification, he would be prosecuted because he falls under this clause as a public servant. Now clause 11 talks about vice chancellor or member of any governing body, professor, reader, lecturer or any other teacher or employee by whatever designation called of any university or and any person whose services have been availed by a university or any other public authority connection with holding or conducting of examination. Right? So when we talk about the lecturers and professors, they are also public servant. Clause A, clause 12 is the final clause of this provision which deals with any provision which deals with any person who is an office bearer or an employee of educational, scientific, social, cultural or other institutions in whatever manner established receiving or having received any financial assistance from the central government or state government or local or other public authority. So if we look at from clause number 1 to 12, we have a list of different public servants. Now, if we look at the explanation, one can see the person falling under any of the above subclauses are public servant, whether appointed by the government or not. It is just by the way of clarification that it is treated as the operating part of the legislation, which means a person could also be prosecuted only when he falls under any of the clauses of the definition section 2 clause c which enumerates the list of the public servant and secondly is that that a public servant who is charged under the prevention of corruption act he enjoys a protection which is provided under section 19 of the act and this is a statutory protection so there may be cases or instances where an honest public servant has been alleged to have taken illegal gratification and this complaint has been filed by someone to settle the score against the innocent public servant. So the law tries to strike a balance. So this public servant cannot be prosecuted unless, until, unless and until the valid sanction has been taken from the competent authority. Now, this is important because it sets the context for our second part of the discussion which will be carried forward in the next session wherein we will be discussing that what are the offences and penalties prescribed under the Prevention of Corruption Act and when we say sanction that is the statutory protection how does a sanction constitute a valid sanction and who will provide this valid sanction? These are some important questions which will be taken up in the next session. Thank you.
Hello, uh, I am A.K. Sharma and I teach sociology in IIT Kanpur. I am going to discuss a question which is frequently posed to sociologists and that is what is the role of sociology in policy making. Now, so far in our country and also in the world, in World Bank, in UN organizations, in Population Council, planning is seen as something for which economists are particularly trained. And very few sociologists were found in planning process. Planning was given to statisticians and to economists. But now gradually planners and states are realizing that sociologists have a very important contribution to make to planning process. What can sociologists do to planning? Sociologists uh, can pose problems, sociology can identify uh, which problems of society need priority or greater intervention. Like Indian society may be suffering from thousands of problems, but since solution of problem requires expenditure of resources in terms of time, money and manpower, all the problems cannot be solved or we cannot focus on all the problems. Do you know that uh, our national health plan focuses only on 15 percent of the diseases from which people in India die? It is not possible to cover all 100 percent diseases in the program. Program means resources. So, sociologists can help us by conducting surveys, by talking to people, by doing field work that from people's perspective which problems need to be given greater attention. Then sociologists can also help the planners in uh, understanding various dimensions of the problem. Suppose you are trying to solve the problem of why in India maternal mortality rate is high. We know that uh, maternal mortality rate means uh, rate of deaths among women uh, associated with childbirth is particularly high. Sociologists tell them that this problem is not going to be solved simply through health intervention. We have to uh, look at uh, things in entirety or totality or what we call holistically and we have to understand that India has a patriarchal system in which uh, there is in rural areas particularly value of life of a woman is very little. This is one meaning of patriarchy. So, if you do not care about your women you will not take them to health center also. There is a problem of transportation, there is a problem of ignorance, people do not know the danger signs, people do not go to ASHAs, people do not go for ANC, people do not understand the danger signs. There are several danger signs which everybody should be able to know if uh, a woman in the family becomes pregnant. Sociologists tell that apart from health interventions, you require other interventions also, education, empowerment, power of women in decision making, nutrition, control of stress, the sociologists can tell the planners all these. And one important role that sociologists can play uh, in planning process is by involving in monitoring and evaluation of development programs. From time to time government launches various programs for the benefit of people like uh, you all have heard about Manrega, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Scheme or Act. 
Manrega, A for Act, S scheme or uh, other welfare programs. Uh, we can, we sociologists can conduct studies and tell to what extent goals of these programs have been attained and what are the bottlenecks or uh, what needs to be done in the future to improve the effectiveness and efficient, effectiveness means reach, efficiency means uh, uh, cost benefit ratio, how to improve effectiveness and efficiency of the program. 